Thank you for joining us today, all of our Albuquerque Science Fiction Society and Bubonicon viewers. Uh, we have a panel of fans and authors who we'll have a discussion with later. But first up, uh, we're going to have a reading from our guest today. She is a Colorado author, multiple award winning. She is a SFWA Grand Master. We're so happy she can join us to talk about her newest Christmas story. Take a look at the five and ten. Please join us in welcoming Connie Willis. Hi. Hi, I'm Connie Willis, and I'm going to be reading from uh, a Christmas story that was in Asimov's Christmas uh, Christmas um, issue this year, uh, their November-December issue, and then has also come out from Subterranean Press with a very pretty cover. Hold the cover up, Craig, because it's really cool. It's a very nifty cover. I really like it a lot. I don't know that you can see it there, but it's very Christmassy. So anyway, uh, so I, I'm just going to read, plunge in. I read from the beginning and I'm plunging in. Okay, <clears throat> this is the quote. Repeat the sounding joy, joy from joy to the world. Everybody has a traumatic Christmas memory and mine was always Christmas dinner, partly because in my family, a term used very loosely, Christmas dinner is actually a series of dinners. Thanksgiving dinner, Christmas dinner, and a New Year's Eve buffet. And if my one-time stepfather had had his way, Dave had his way, we'd also have St. Lucia's Day and Boxing Day and Twelfth Night dinners and who knows what else. And he's very big on family gatherings, even though he's been married at least half a dozen times and has terrible taste in women, including where my mother was concerned, which means he thinks of it of me as his daughter even though he was only married to her for about 15 minutes back when I was eight and is always really nice to me, even to the extent of helping me with college. So it's hard for me to say no to coming. I'm not the only sort of relative he invites. There's also Aunt Mildred, actually a great aunt of Dave's second wife and Grandma Elving, the grandmother of his fourth. Got all that straight? Also at the dinner are Dave's current wife, Jillian, another bad marital choice. Her stuck-up daughter, Sloan, Sloan's boyfriend of the moment, who is always blonde and tall and going to law school or med school, and Jillian's equally stuck-up friends, who Jillian introduces Aunt Mildred, Grandma Elving, and me to by saying, Dave is so kind, he wants to make sure everyone has some place to go for the holidays, as if we were people he'd picked up on the sidewalk outside a homeless shelter or something. Add to that the fact that Jillian refuses to have roast turkey and pumpkin pie like normal people and insists on serving, serving poached sturgeon and Senegalese locust pods, that Aunt Mildred complains about everything from the table settings to my fail, failure to bring a date, and that Grandma Elving insists on telling the same interminable story of how she worked at Woolworths in downtown Denver one Christmas every single year. And you can see why I start dreading Thanksgiving dinner sometime in July. This year was no exception. Jillian met me at the door with a look that said clearly, why didn't you use the servant's entrance and the news that I needed to go pick up Grandma Elving? There's Dave's on a conference call, she said, and he doesn't think she should be driving. Couldn't I go get her instead? Elaine Sloan's boyfriend said to me. He was named Lassiter this year and was even taller and blonder than usual. Oh no, Lassiter, I couldn't let you do that, Jillian said. You're a guest. Ori can go. She turned to me and by the and on the way, pick up some ice and some turmeric. And don't drive Grandma Elving anywhere near downtown on the way back, Sloan said. I don't want her telling that stupid Woolworth story again. Woolworths? Lassiter asked. It was a dime store, I explained. It's kind of a variety store, like the dollar store, Sloan said putting her hand possessively on Lassiter's arm. She worked there one Christmas back in the 50s when she was a girl, and we have to listen to her go on about it every single year. Really, he said, that's interesting. No, it's not, Sloan said. It's boring beyond belief. So Ori, whatever you do, don't mention Christmas shopping or snow or Bing Crosby, Jillian put in. Oh God, yes, especially don't mention Bing Crosby or lunch counters or nativity scenes. She turned to Lassiter, and if she starts in, don't encourage her. She can go on for hours. Just ignore her or change the subject. She turned back to me. Do not say anything to her on the way that way here that'll set her off, which was easier said than done. Almost anything from buses to the weather reminded her of it. 
even the traffic lights. Look at them turning from red to green, she said, after I'd picked her up from her retirement community apartment. They look so festive, almost like Christmas decorations themselves. I remember that Christmas I worked at Woolworths, getting off work and seeing them blinking red and green on 16th Street. Jillian asked me to pick up a few items, I said, pulling into Safeway. Is there anything you want? No, she said. I don't suppose they'd have hot roasted nuts. They, they, have, they sold hot salted peanuts and cashews at Wal Woolworths from this little red and white striped cart. It had a yellow heat lamp in it to keep the nuts warm and little paper bags to scoop them into. <clears throat> I'll see, I said. Will you be warm enough sitting here, I asked, looking at her doubtfully. She was bundled up in a, in a black cloth coat and a gray scarf and gloves, but she was awfully thin and frail looking and my car heater doesn't work all that well. Oh, I'll be fine, she said. This is much warmer than that bus I used to take that Christmas I worked at Woolworths. Um, it was so cold, the windows used to frost over and I fled into the store, grabbed the ice and the turmeric and hurried back out, hoping she'd forgotten about the roasted nuts. She had, she was looking at the Santa Claus collecting money on, for charity outside Safeway's main door. That Christmas I worked at Woolworths, there was a Santa right outside the front door. He had a cotton wool beard and a chimney you put the money in. It was made out of, Aunt Mildred's going to be at dinner, I said, trying to change the topic. And Sloan and her new boyfriend and Stan and Louise Devers, is he cute? Grandma Elving asked, or whatever it is you girls call it nowadays. Stan Devers, I said, he was at least 50 and completely bald. No, Sloan's boyfriend, she said, is he cute? And more importantly, is he nice? Yes, I said, even though I was basing that solely on his having offered to pick up Grandma Elving and the fact that he'd spoken to me at all. Most of Sloan's boyfriends, none, I'm sorry, none of Sloan's boyfriends had ever so much as asked me if I wanted some more salad. Though last year it had been distressed kale with anchovies, so that was no loss. Lassiter, she repeated, thoughtfully, Lassiter. There was a boy named Lamar who worked in the music department at Woolworths that Christmas. They sold rec record players and, and 45s and guitar picks, she said, and was off again. I'm sorry, I, I turned off the red light because I could not see and, and the, light, the light was better. And now I can't see the manuscript. So I'm turning it back on, I apologize. Okay, dinner was just as bad. Mrs. Deavers said, what a lovely table, Jillian. And Grandma Elving piped up, your tablecloth looks just like the ones we used to sell at Woolworths. They were white with poinsettias embroidered on them and they came in a set with eight napkins for $2.99. Jillian, who'd never paid $2.99 for anything in her life, looked offended. And Sloan leaned across the table to whisper to me, I thought I told you not to get her started on Woolworths, Ori. In my day, Aunt Mildred said, glaring at me, we were taught it was rude to carry on private conversations at the table and launched into a diatribe on the current decline in table manners and civility in general. When she paused to take a breath, Jillian said, so Lassiter, Sloan tells me you're in medical school. Yes, at CU, he said. Ori goes to CU too, Dave said. You do, Lassiter said, what are you majoring in? Lassiter's going to be a neuroscientist, Sloan interrupted. He's working with Dr. Reardon on a major project. Tell them about it, Lassiter. It involves memory, doesn't it? Memory's such a strange thing, Grandma Elving said musingly. I can remember that Christmas I worked at Woolworths like it was yesterday. Uh-oh, there she goes again, I thought, and started to say, this venison carpaccio is delicious, Jillian, a lie. But Sloan had me, beaten me to the punch. Lassiter works all the time, she said. I practically had to tie him down and threaten him with violence to get him to take two weeks off and go skiing with me in Vail. We're going up tomorrow. You young people always running around, Aunt Mildred said disapprovingly. In my day, young people stayed put. I didn't, Grandma Elving said. That Christmas at Woolworths, I worked in a different department almost every day. Leather goods, the cosmetic counter, the music department selling 45s, Perry Como and Rosemary Clooney and Bing Crosby. Woolworths had piped in music too. I can remember them playing Silver Bells and it's beginning to look a lot like Christmas. And Ori, have you found a job yet? Sloan cut in, trying to head Grandma Elving off. 
and remind everybody that I, unlike her, had to work during Christmas break. No, not yet, I said. I have an interview tomorrow with young people today don't even know what work is, Aunt Mildred interrupted. In my day, what else do you remember about that Christmas besides the music, Mrs. Elving? Lassiter interrupted. As you came into the store, and Sloan looked like she wanted to throttle him. He won't be at Christmas dinner, I thought. Do you remember what it smelled like when you walked into the store, he prompted. Oh my, yes, Grandma Elving said. Roasted nuts and fudge and pine from the Christmas tree by the door. Lassiter, Sloan said warningly, but he was oblivious. What else do you remember, he asked. Um, the store had silver garlands wrapped around the pillars and red and green bells, you know, the kind made out of pleated paper that fold out. And is everyone ready for dessert? Jillian asked brightly. It's Leche's flambe. Grandma Elving didn't hear, hear her. The store windows had artificial snow around the edges, she said, and Christmas lights strung across the top and they were always steamed up. Lassiter didn't hear Jillian either, even when she told me to go, <clears throat> even when she told, when Jillian told me to go tell the maid to bring dessert in. You said you could hear Christmas music playing, he persisted. Can you remember hearing any other sounds? Oh my, yes. The shoppers talking and the cash registers ringing up sales and Santa Claus ringing his bell across the street. Oh, and the traffic. They had cars on 16th Street then and... It took the arrival of flaming pyres of lychee nuts and Aunt Mildred's subsequent remarks on fire danger to bring them to a stop. What were you thinking? Sloan whispered to Lassiter as the after dinner coffee, balsamic espresso, was being poured. I told you she can go on for hours. Really, he said, looking thoughtfully over at Grandma Elving. And I was afraid he was going to go over and ask her what else she remembered, but he didn't. And we got to spend the rest of the evening discussing the comparative merits of Aspen Vale and Snowmass for skiing and how people nowadays didn't know how to make a decent cup of coffee and why didn't I have a job yet or a boyfriend. Can't you find one for her Sloan? Mrs. Devers asked. You know lots of young men. There must be one who, she didn't finish the sentence, but it was clear what she'd intended to say. One who's not too picky, who wouldn't mind going out with an unemployed shirt tail relative who can't get a boyfriend of her own. An absolutely delightful beginning to the Christmas season. I could hardly wait for Christmas. I used, I used taking the coffee cups to the kitchen as a way to go get my things from the guest bedroom so I could sneak out and at least not get stuck taking Grandma Elvin home, which would be a perfect ending to a perfect night. But as I was putting on my boots, Lassiter came in. Can I talk to you for a minute, he asked, pulling the door shut behind him. I'm sure, I said astonished that one of Sloan's boyfriends had actually registered the fact that I existed, let alone wanted to talk to me, and a little flustered. He was so, in Grandma Elving's word, cute. Good, it's about your grandmother, he said. Oh, well, I knew it was too good to be true. She's not actually my grandmother, I said, yanking on the other one. She's my stepfather's grandmother-in-law from his fourth marriage. Oh, he said, but you've heard her talk about the Christmas she worked at Woolworths before, right? Yes. Every Christmas, I said, wondering what this was leading up to. He was a med student. He was probably going to tell me repeating the same story over and over again was a symptom of dementia, which wouldn't exactly surprise me. Is the story consistent, he asked, or does it change from telling to telling? No, I said. I mean, she tells different details each time, but the story stays basically the same. Good, he murmured as if to himself. And it's a true story. She really did work at Woolworths. As far as I know, I said, I mean, obviously I wasn't there, but she's been telling the story for as long as I've known her. And why would she make up a story about working at Woolworths when she could just as easily have invented one about spending Christmas in Paris or something? That's true, he conceded. Is there a point to the story, a moral? You mean, is it a lecture in disguise like Aunt Mildred's stories? Things were better in the old days or young people nowadays don't know the meaning of the word work or something, no. Hmm, interesting, he said, but that's not what I meant. I meant it's the story about an event in her life, like how she met her husband. No, it's totally pointless. He frowned for a minute and then said, do lots of things remind her of it? Are you kidding? Everything reminds her of it. He nodded as if that had been what he thought. Do you know if something traumatic happened while she was working there? Traumatic, I said blankly. Shocking or frightening or tragic like finding out her boyfriend had been killed in World War II or something. 
I don't think Grandma Elving's quite that old, I said. Why do you think something happened to her when she worked there? Because memories like hers are triggered by a trauma of some kind. I was about to ask him what he meant by memories like hers when Jillian opened the door, looked daggers at me like I'd enticed Lassiter in there or something and said brightly, oh, here you are, Lassiter. Sloan, he's in here. She turned to me. Good, you're still here, Ori. I was afraid you'd left. You need to take Grandma Elving home. But at least part one of the horror was over and I had four weeks to brace myself for part two, or not. On Monday morning, Grandma Elving called me and asked if I could give her a ride to an appointment. Dave promised he'd drive me, she told me, but he was called out of town on business and Sloan's in the mountains, so Jillian said to call you, which meant if I turned her down, the main topic at Christmas dinner would be how selfish and heartless I was, especially since the appointment turned out to be at a medical clinic in Cherry Creek. But at least I could make it clear to her that this was a one-time thing. So as soon as I got her in the car, I said, I've got a job interview this afternoon. And after that, I'll be working, but I'll be happy to show you how to call an Uber. They're really fast and reliable. So you still haven't found a job for Christmas vacation, she asked. No, I said, and half expected her to suggest I apply at Woolworths, even though the store had been out of business for years. But she didn't. She said, how would you like a job driving me? and named an hourly wage that was more than I could make at Starbucks or the mall. But it would mean having to listen to her Woolworths story for a solid month. I wasn't sure I could stand that. I'm waiting to hear about a job at Starbucks, I lied, and I told them I was available. So, well, if it doesn't work out, I'd love to have you as, a as my chauffeur. I know how hard it is for students to find a job. That Christmas I worked at Woolworths, I applied at I don't know how many places before they hired me and launched into the familiar story of her working at the dime store. It was so exciting being there. The store was all decorated and the tree by the front door had bubble lights on it. You probably don't know what those are. They were Christmas tree lights shaped like candles with red and green and gold liquid in them that bubbled when they got hot. They were so pretty. There was certainly nothing traumatic about that. She sounded happy recounting the story and her wrinkled face lit up with pleasure at the memory. There was no moral either, no lectures about what a hard worker she'd been or how girls in her day had known what Christmas really meant, which was strange now that I thought about it. Aunt Mildred wasn't the only old person who told stories about the failings of the younger generation and the vast superiority of the good old days. Everybody I knew over the age of 60 did, but not Grandma Elving. The fact that the memory was so clear was strange too. I couldn't remember that many details about Thanksgiving dinner and that had only been a few days ago. She was still talking about the Christmas decorations. They had evergreen garlands strung above the center aisle, she said, with a big red bow in the center. Those are pretty gloves you're wearing, I said. They look warm. Kidskin, she said. That Christmas I worked at Woolworths, one of the departments I worked in was leather goods and they sold gloves just like these. Of course they did, I thought. There's a lot of traffic today, I said, but it didn't even put a dent in the flow. They sold all kinds of leather gloves, pig skin and Moroccan leather and suede, she said, and handbags and wallets and music boxes, pink and blue ones with satin linings that played the blue Danube when you opened the lid. Every time I hear that song, I think of those music boxes. Some of them had a little ballerina that spun around too. The music boxes, got us all the way out to Spear. What, all, I'm sorry, all the way out Spear. What street's the doctor's office on, I asked her. Oh my, I don't know, she said, which surprised me. I'd assumed she was going to see her regular doctor. She must be going to see a specialist. I wrote it down, she said, fumbling in her handbag. And please don't let that remind her of the handbags they used to sell at Woolworths, I thought. Here it is, she said, pulling out a slip of paper. She read me the address and I drove to it, wondering what sort of specialist she was going to. The building didn't offer any clue. It listed dozens of clinics and labs and the door of the office she headed for said only UC Health and under that Hayden Clinic. Grandma Elvin gave her name to the receptionist and she said, oh yes, he's expecting you and disappeared through a door. I glanced over at the magazine rack thinking it might have pamphlets that would give me a clue, managing your cancer or the 10 warning signs of heart disease or something, but all they had was copies of travel and people. There's no help there. I'd have to hope the doctor when he came out would have a specialty on the name tag of his lab coat. It didn't. He wasn't wearing a lab coat. He was wearing the same blazer and chinos he'd worn at Thanksgiving dinner. Lassiter, I said, surprised. What are you doing here? I thought you were in Vail with Sloan. 
I was. Sloane's still up there. She's staying till Christmas, but I couldn't take that much time off. I've got this research project that's due. Well, he definitely won't be at Christmas dinner, I thought. Sloane didn't like guys that weren't constantly at her beck and call. Research project, I inquired. He means me, Grandma Elving said. And when I looked blankly at her, I'm the project. This young man is going to record my memories of that Christmas I worked at Woolworths. You are, I said. Yes, Lassiter said happily. She's agreed to let me take down a full account of her memory. And I thought, oh, you have no idea what you are letting yourself in for. Okay, that's as far as I'm going to read. So um, I... Wrote this story <laughs> because I worked at Woolworths one Christmas and um, um, I had a wonderful time working there and lots of memories. And yes, they did have little music boxes that with the Blue Danube and the little ballerina that spun around and um, really cheap music boxes. Now that I think about it, really pathetically cheap but, uh, music boxes, but I thought they were wonderful. So. Anyway, uh, and my memory, of course, was, unlike Grandma Elving's, somewhat faulty. So I spent a lot of time with um, old catalogs and old uh, and uh, Vermont country store uh, catalogs, which they specialize in, in things from that generation, and then asking everybody what they remembered about that time. So anyway, so uh, now I guess we're going to talk and uh, any questions and discussion, right? Yes. Yes. So, yes. Great nods. <laughs> okay. All right. So uh, you said you worked at Woolworths. So what was your inspiration uh, <laughs> directly for writing this story? Okay. I told Cordelia she was not allowed to ask this question. <laughs> um, the inspiration for this story was that um, as I say, I loved working at Woolworths that year, and uh, I, in fact, I talk later about a nativity set that the, the Grandma Elving bought piece by piece. They're, they used to have nativity sets that you could buy, you know, you could buy the, the lambs, and you could buy the shepherd, and you could buy the wise men, and all that separately, and then you could buy the, the creche. I never bought the creche, uh, but I did buy all of the different creatures and people um, a few at a time, every time I got paid. And I still have that set. And I still put that out every Christmas. It's my nativity set. And when I do, then I talk about that story. And I talk about it sometimes other times too. <laughs> Cordelia is laughing. Like if we happen to be in downtown Denver, or if we happen to be in a dime store, or pretty much I hear music or pretty or much hear anything music. <laughs> at it's all crazy. Christmas related. Yes, and so I have basically told this story to my poor husband and child about a million times, and they were they get more and more fed up. I don't know why. So I decided that I would see if I could write down the story and if that would improve things. Um, maybe I could get it out of my system, and uh, and then um, I wouldn't tell it anymore. So that was kind of the inspiration for it. Other people seem to like hearing this story, Cordelia. So. <laughs> But as she pointed out, they haven't heard it a jillion times. So perhaps that's it. So anyway, that was the inspiration behind it. And somebody asked me the other day who the inspiration for Aunt Mildred was. And I was like, you're kidding, right? I mean, <laughs> everyone. Everyone has an Aunt Mildred. <laughs> I know millions of old people who talk this way and every single word out of their mouth is in my day, people knew how to do this or that or the other thing. And I, so yeah. So not really too hard to trace that inspiration. So, yeah. <laughs> so do you guys have memories of people and things like that or horrible Christmas dinners or whatever? I did think, I did think Jillian's Christmas dinners were pretty extraordinarily horrible. Um, and I based that on a really bad experience I had with some carpaccio one time in Spain and uh, <laughs> never got over. And so, um, but, but uh, the world is full of snotty people and the world is full of pretty much everybody, all the different types that are in that story, I think. So, unless you guys have never encountered any of those people. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> no, I like the juxtaposition of them all. And um, 
adding that tension to this, those every those scenes that everyone knows, and you can just fill in the blank so well just because of <laughs> how you've positioned everybody in there at the table. Yeah, because I think everybody, I mean, there these family dinners can be absolute nightmares, and I don't know if they're any better on Zoom this year or not. <laughs> I guess because you can mute people maybe if you're in charge, but. Um, but yeah, there are dinners you dread because they always ask you horrible, horrible questions and and uh, behave badly. And my sisters and I, my sisters and I used to say, "It's not Thanksgiving until somebody cries." Yeah, that's right. Oh my goodness! Exactly. <laughs> it's sad, but that is in fact the way it is in a lot of families. Have that family drama. Yeah. Yeah. Every picture of us growing up from an Easter, one child is crying. <laughs> every picture someone is crying somebody's cr well and you remember that vividly right <laughs> yes and you know as we've gotten older you hope that it's the uh next generation that is crying like yes. you know but it, it <laughs> never is it still, never it, is right. no no <laughs> it's never if there's one generation meeting out the punishments and the other generation crying so and i can actually top that one thanksgiving dinner we had with my mother-in-law which was a and, a, and a, a lot of other people, my grandmother and a whole bunch of other people. Um, and it was fairly fraught. And then at the end of it, my mother-in-law said, surprise, you don't know this, but I was secretly taping this entire conversation and then proceeded to play it <laughs> over again, sat it in the middle of the table, hit play, and we had to listen to it again. <laughs> and so I was like, okay, living through a bad, Thanksgiving or Christmas dinner is bad enough. <laughs> Living through it twice is the ultimate. So, yeah. Wow. Oh. I think you were saying that the, the nativity scene pieces collecting and that made me think about what uh, other uh, treasured gifts or decorations people got for either Christmas or Hanukkah as they were growing up that they still have, you know, that treasured memory of. Yeah. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to know what other people have in their lives. We have a whole assortment of um, ornaments at that date back as far as as far as my grandmother and uh, my favorite, which no longer really works properly, but uh, because because Christmas tree bulbs have changed size. Um, but um, she had a it was a little plastic, all of all of everything that we have that I remember is very pathetic and cheap and small and we love them all. Uh, anyway, it was a little sort of diorama of Bethlehem, you know, with the tiny, tiny little Mary and Joseph in the front and the crib, but, um, but the whole city. And then the, you put it over with wires, you put it over the light and then the light shone through the background so that it looked like stars and then the star of Bethlehem. And that was so cool, but now it doesn't work properly because because the, the bulbs aren't the right size anymore. They changed the, the size of the bulbs, so yeah. So what do other people have? I have a set of silver bells that you wind up and they play a Christmas carol. Ooh. And um, my, my father started this tradition with when he married my mom. And so every year, every Christmas he would get her another bell. And so there's this whole set that my sister and I divvied up after they passed away. So we, I have half the bells and she has the other half and we polish them and put them on the mantelpiece and play them every okay. now and then. Yeah. Not, not as often as we did when we were little. Um, it's a little more fraught now, but at the time <laughs> it was a lot, it was like, oh, let's play that one again, you know, kind of. Yeah, thing. that's great. Yeah, that, I don't think that, I've ever seen those. Those are great. Yeah. I still have some, I, I didn't put them on the tree this year, but I think it was, I think it's from a German background, but there's a tradition of putting these mushrooms on your tree. They have little clips for the branches. And then there's also these glass birds that have a, um, I don't, almost like a brush type tail that clip on. Uh, Those well, are yeah. Older. yeah, I have seen. Yeah. And then we still put a, yeah. we do put the Christmas pickle on our tree because uh, that's right. Can, what is it, the smallest child or the most innocent child is supposed to be able to find the Christmas pickle or something? I don't mm -hmm. know how to see it is. Yeah. We what also have, oh, oh, sorry. I'm just going to say, we also have the world's saddest Kermit and Miss Piggy ornament, which Craig <laughs> gave me, I think, on our first Christmas together, which 
poor thing was very poorly made and his little leg is kicked up and his arm is flung <laughs> out and he's hugging piggy and so far his leg is broken off twice and we've had to glue it back on craig was going to put some stuff away the other day and found his hand just laying on the oh. ground and glued it back on and i'm just like i can't bear to part with it but he's getting sadder by the year <laughs> as his limbs keep snapping off just don't look closely <laughs> yeah, don't look closely Kermit. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. The problem with like things like the blown glass ornaments and the things yeah. that kids make in elementary school is that they don't have a really long shelf life. They tend to, to fall apart. Cordy made a bunch of clay ornaments, which lasted much longer than they probably should have, right, Cord? Yeah. But eventually all broke while being put away or taken down or the cat knocked them off the tree or whatever. So, so yeah. I have a couple of ones that I had made when I was you know very young but we don't put them out anymore because they're just kind of just sad little artifacts in the bottom <laughs> of the ornament box <laughs> yeah 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 I've, I've started a collection I'm I'm Jewish so we have a we've started a collection of Hanukkiahs what that we light you know with each night of Hanukkah but this year uh, my son who's two got a little Hanukkah pack and um, it came with a little foil foil Hanukkah so we used that one because I didn't want anything happening to the nice ones and right. the fire and everything so I just felt weird because we've got like four of them in the cabinet and we pull out this little tin foil one that we lit every <laughs> night this year but, uh, yeah 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 and then uh um I've, I've also got like a huge bag of dreidels that he just loves to dump all over the floor but <laughs> and play with but uh when I actually when I went to Israel I was really excited because the dreidels in Israel are a little bit different um the ones in everywhere else in the world have four Hebrew letters on them that stand for a Hebrew phrase um, that means a great miracle happened there, but the ones in Israel actually have a different fourth letter to signify the great miracle happened here. So oh. when I was in Israel, I went and I was super excited to get a, a dreidel with um, the Hebrew letter of pay instead of shin on it. So I have that. So that's one of my um, favorite ones, I, although I don't let anybody Ooh. really play with it. I don't want it to get messed up. <laughs> that's really cool. Yeah. Yeah. If you have a two-year-old, that's going to be over soon, I have to tell you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, the, duplicates of everything. Yeah. <laughs> well, so many people decorate now. I think Hallmark's changed the whole ball game because I got oh. one friend that she likes hockey, so she has lots of hockey ornaments. Um, we get all the Muppet ornaments and uh, some of the uh, Warner Brothers cartoons ornaments <laughs> in too. So I I was looking at our tree right now. I was like, oh, this is a complete nerd mobile tree. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, that is kind of cool that there are all these that re specifically remind you of, of things. I have a mind the gap ornament that unfortunately is blown glass. So if we don't mind the gap and we're not careful, <laughs> it's not going to be with us very long and stuff. And I have a St. Paul's Cathedral ornament. I have a couple of those. actually. Well, actually, I have several of those. I really <laughs> like St. Paul. <laughs> so. But and some folks don't seem to be really Christmas related, like, or holiday related. They're like <laughs> sloths and, you know, llamas. Bulldogs, bulldogs. But, <laughs> bulldogs. We have a, bulldogs are very Christmassy. So. I have a bunch <laughs> of dinosaurs on mine. Right yeah, dinosaurs, sure. yeah. <laughs> I saw somebody this year on Instagram that had a, a dinosaur Hanukkah, and I was like, I want yes. that. <laughs> yes, my, my <laughs> friends had that. My friends got a dinosaur Hanukkah, and apparently the artist... Uh, wrote this whole thing up about how everyone knows that dinosaurs are Jewish. And it was this whole long <laughs> explanation and, that came with the Hanukkah. And my friends read That's it awesome. to me. It was awesome. So, <laughs> so, what, so, we, so what, what dinosaurs are on it? Um, I think it was, I think it was, a, it, if I recall, uh, I think it's like a, or the one I saw was like a T-Rex and then oh, it was, yeah. it was down the, you know, oh, okay. like down, down the, the back, back of yep. the, the oh, T-Rex. Okay. okay, okay, I see. So, yeah. It's almost like the storyteller tradition of the Southwest. I don't know. Okay. What's that? <laughs> well, because my grandma and the storyteller, we have a, we have a, it's basically a bear with all the different um, Pueblo people riding down its back. From oh, the, okay, yeah, yes, yes, I have seen that. Yes, very much like that, so. Yeah. That's cool. 
Yeah. Now, now we all want one. So Jamie asked us where to go. Right. <laughs> I don't know. I just saw it on a picture. Yeah, I was like, no, oh, Cordelia's friend has to tell yeah, us. Where to go. Yeah. Find out from my friend. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure yeah. Google would be very helpful. It's, it's, it's weird how different countries have different. I mean, you know, I know we all talk about, you know, the Christmas tree came from Germany and all this stuff. But I, I, when I was in Spain one time, I was there near Christmas and they took me to a, an outdoor Christmas fair kind of thing. And um, they have, they have lots of crushes and you can buy the pieces totally separately, you know, so, um, and which was great, except then they had to explain to me, there is a man squatting with his pants down, who is a big part of their nativity scene. And I'm like, <laughs> okay. And he's in like every single nativity scene that they showed me that had one. And I'm like, you want to explain that to me? I did not find the explanation really good. <laughs> <laughs> or it didn't seem to explain anything to me, but I guess, I mean, they were, it was fine for them. So I, I don't know, but I'm sure uh, when that happened, I thought, I wonder how many of our holiday uh, traditions are completely inexplicable to other people, you know, and I'm sure that quite a few of them are, you know, because it's like, and especially when, you know, I also know people with trees that are totally decorated with chili peppers or with whatever. And, and, you know, that would be if you were trying to explain this to someone from another country or to, to an alien, it would be tricky, I think. So, <laughs> so yeah. So, so in my family, speaking of hard to, I, we're, we're very Southern uh, and uh, very religious uh, Christian. And so on Christmas, you make a birthday cake and you put a candle oh. on it and you take it outside for the wind to blow out. Uh, and we would do this when we were little. So it was like, Jesus is blowing out the birthday candle. And oh, I'm wow. like, yeah, how, how do you explain that to an alien? Right. I don't, yes. I don't know. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> you get to eat the cake though, Mandy. That's the big We question. do. We get to eat the cake. And um, this is not made up by my family. We are not the only people who do this. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> but uh yeah it's uh usually though only one candle you know as opposed to i guess 2021 right. candles right. Which <laughs> nobody could blow out yeah. yeah that would be tricky that would be unless you had a major windstorm <laughs> <laughs> that that sounds like the reverse of what we do for a lot of our holidays which is open the door so that elijah can come in <laughs> and <Yeah>. visit <laughs> right but not bring the wind with him right <laughs> correct yeah yeah, yeah. So yeah, it's, uh, I have, I also think, you know, we've come so far, uh, so many people, the religious part of the holiday that underpins the holiday is not a part of a lot of people's celebration. And they're like unaware of what that underpinning is, except in a really peripheral way. And so, you know, that w that's why you get such bizarre interpretations of Christmas carols sometimes, you know, it's like what they're saying is not what they're really saying and stuff. And, and when I look at Christmas carols, I did a story on um, called I'll Seated on the Ground, which is about a bunch of aliens who come to earth and, and have a bizarre reaction to the lyrics of Christmas carols. And that meant that I had to draw on my many years of being in a church choir singing really terrible songs with awful lyrics. Verse three, verse three is always the worst. And it's <laughs> one that they always leave out. And if, the, if there are five verses, verse four is the worst. And if there are six verses, verses four and five, probably <laughs> really the whole middle is bad. And, uh, but it just found all kinds of bizarre things that I know would make no sense to anyone. And particularly if, if taken literally, you know, so, so it is inexplicable. And I'm sure most, most people, they do the things because it was handed down. But if you ask them, if you really put them on the spot and said, why exactly do you do this again? They, they would really have a hard time explaining. So, yeah. well, it's like good King Wenceslas. Like yes. most people have only ever heard the first verse of Good right. King Wenceslas and they know it's a Christmas song. They have no idea what it means, how it's related to Christmas, nothing because well, Good King Wenceslas is as a matter right, of fact. Right. Yeah. Right. And um, so I, I uh, used to be in charge of the holiday show at my Unitarian church for the kids. And because we were Unitarian, um, 
we kind of had full reign to do whatever. So like one year, my story was all about how we got all the, the German traditions came over via uh, Albert who married Queen Victoria and stuff. Um, and one year I did a whole thing on Hanukkah and we did the whole story of Hanukkah and all of the traditions and everything. But uh, one year we acted out the whole thing of Good King Wenceslas and like the whole background story of that and, it Which has like six verses, doesn't it? Right, have it has, yeah, it, it, it's five verses, but like the story behind it is really interesting. And, and anyway, and so I wrote this whole thing that the whole thing, the, the entire church play was about uh, kind Duke Wenceslas, because he really isn't a king. <laughs> he really was a duke. And anyway, but- um, A saint, it, right? Didn't he become a saint? Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. So it's anyway, but- him. But, but, you know, that's something where I, I will often hear just the first verse of Good King Wenceslas, right. like, you know, on TV shows or whatever. And I'm like, no one has any idea what this song is about or how it's related to anything. Right. And it only makes sense if you sing all the verses. So. <laughs> <laughs> right. Exactly. Because it is a story. Well, and so many, so many hymns, uh, carol, Christmas carols started out as hymns, which started out as poems. So like, right. I heard the bells on Christmas Day as a Longfellow poem, I think, really long, a really long Longfellow poem with like eight or nine verses and stuff, and and uh, just uh, and ones by Christina Rossetti, and and then of course Green Sleeves has the wrong words if you know the words to Green Sleeves, and then, uh, just there there it's just a mishmash of all kinds of stuff, and 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 then the modern things. What what always amazes me is how you know you'll get a, a Christmas album of Christmas standards. <laughs> it will be rock around the, you know, rocking around the Christmas tree and jingle bell rock. And I'm like, those are not standards. <laughs> they are, they are modern songs. They are pop They're songs. songs that we just got. They do not count as classics. <laughs> well, I mean, I like them. But only when you're when you're my age, they do not feel like classics. So I always find we always talk but, about this I'm at sorry, work. Chris. I was gonna say we always talk about at work about I can't remember the name of the song, but the one that goes, there'll be uh scary ghost stories and is right. one of the lyrics. Sounds of the glory and which, of Christmas is long, long ago. ago. Which of course is referring to it's the most Christmas Carol. Here. <laughs> but yeah, but it's a really weird verse to have in the middle of Christmas song. We're going right. to have scary ghost stories. It's Christmas. This is not Halloween. Right. <laughs> right. Except that that's like one of the oldest traditions of Christmas. One of the yeah. oldest. Because uh, it was thought that spirits were, um, were, were closest to the earth, that the barrier between earth and, and the spirit world was the, the thinnest at Christmas time. And so that's why in, you know, Christmas Carol, the, the ghosts, the spirits are outside his window, you know, and sailing back and forth. And it was a tradition to, to write and tell ghost stories at Christmas. That was probably the oldest form of Christmas story was like um, Dickens wrote um, the, uh, the chimes. The chimes. Yeah. The chimes, but also the, the sexton, kidnapped by goblins or the goblins who kidnapped a sexton or something and all of those he wrote a lot of ghost stories of course christmas carol is a ghost story also but yes he wrote the chimes and i was this i just read the chimes like a few years ago and oh my god i'm so i i this one year i thought i'm gonna read all the non-christmas carol uh christmas stories by dickens because he wrote like five or six of them you know so I read Cricket on the Hearth and now is okay. And then I read, started reading the chimes and it's about this guy who's really poor and his life is going all to pieces and his daughter wants to get married, but can't because they don't have any money and he's about to lose his job and everything is just going all to hell. And so he decides to kill himself and to go up on the, in the tower that he, he's the like, a he's like a messenger boy or something. And so his, his headquarters is the foot of this tower. And so he's going to go up in the bell tower and throw himself off because it would be better if he had never lived. Does any of this sound familiar to you? And then he goes up there and the, the spirits of the bells show him 
what his life, what the world would have been like and what the, the lives of all his loved ones would have been like had he never been born. By this kind of life. Person, I am <laughs> shouting. Frank Capra stole it. Frank Capra they stole it. Stole it from Dickens. <laughs> and they never even mentioned that they stole it from Dickens. And I'm like, you could mention it. I know he's, you know, public domain, but you could at least have mentioned based on a story by Charles Dickens. And that would have been a nice thing to do. But no. I know. But my, that was another thing that we did at my, as a holiday play at my church. And so I spent one entire Thanksgiving uh, looking at thrift stores for clothes that could pass as Victorian clothes, <laughs> because of course we had absolutely no budget and right. I only had like six kids in it. And so all of them had to play multiple roles. So all of their costumes had to consist of like, you know, just a cape or a hat or whatever, because they had to like, you know, go off stage and come back on and go off stage and come back on. So we spent an entire Thanksgiving searching thrift stores for yes, costumes that could pass as Victorian. So you could do, did you do the chimes? Yeah, we did. I wrote it. I wrote, I wrote a version of the chimes and that's what we did one year. Did so. you say it was by Dickens? Yes, I had the entire introduction was saying, that this is a story that might be familiar to many people, but most of you probably don't know the origin of it. It actually okay. was written the year after A Christmas Carol. So. Okay, all right. I, I hate I, to say I, I did. thought I'd be mad at Jim, Jimmy Stewart, but sure enough. <laughs> so. Oh, I wanted I, to. I didn't really. Oh, go ahead, Lauren. Oh, I was just going to say, I was, I was wondering, as we're talking, something you said last time, Connie, um, was about how we're always chasing that perfect Christmas. And I'm uh, wondering if some of these kind of kind of lost in translation kind of traditions, where we're trying to recreate what had happened before, but we don't understand right. the original context, so it becomes reinterpreted by the current generation or whatever. I wonder how that kind of plays out and if that's a factor. I think that's a, to me, I don't know what other people think, but that's a big to me, that's a big part of it. I love the line in a uh, Christmas story where he says, he's talking about his air rifle, <laughs> his Red Rider air rifle, which I can never do that whole long thing with the compass and the stock. Um, and he says, it was the best gift I have ever received or ever would receive. And I thought, oh, that's so true. That's so true. You're always trying to chase that, that holiday when you were eight years old, nine years old, and uh, you had, this perfect experience somewhere and you wish you could get it back and really if you could go back in time and look at it, it his wasn't that perfect art you know ours weren't that perfect but they feel perfect in retrospect I, in retrospect i think so how do you guys feel about that well i i think some of those moments that aren't perfect sometimes become tradition too i i know right. <laughs> i know in my family um you know no, nobody in my family used cranberry sauce at thanksgiving but we always did jello and that was like the one thing my mom would forget to make oh. and put in <laughs> the fridge so it's become right. this like tradition like oh my god i forgot to make the jello like every year right. and right. and somehow and you know now that i've been hosting it at my house i forget <laughs> so it yeah, just got passed right. down <laughs> and and other people forget they make it forget to take it out of the fridge until after yep. the dinner is long right. over. Yeah. yeah it either doesn't get made or it gets made and forgotten in the fridge because everything else makes it to the table <laughs> yeah yeah i think that's tr i think that's true too all the we always have at our christmas openings my grandmother always used to at some point during all this opening stare at the presents and then go there are too many presents here. We get to, we shouldn't get so many presents. <laughs> so now that my grandmother is no longer here, we, we have a designated person who has to say that aloud. It's not really Christmas until someone has said that. So it is always true. So <laughs> we what I think is interesting about like chasing this idea of the perfect Christmas is with Hollywood and Hallmark and oh. Christmas songs is they've manufactured this idea of what a perfect Christmas is. And as somebody who has lived in the South most of my life, like Albuquerque, where I live now, is literally the furthest North I have ever lived. <laughs> uh, I never had a white Christmas and I don't know why you would want that. Like, you know, there's all these songs about sleigh bells and the only song that makes sense to me is here we go a wassailing among the leaves so green because, right. right. <laughs> you know, uh, and 
it's, it's just like, this is not my experience at all. And yet every movie I've ever watched has been like, this is what you should want. Snow right. on Christmas. Snow on Christmas. Yeah. And of course, if when you're a kid, snow on Christmas is really cool. But when you're an adult, all you can think of is having to drive somewhere and get there so, safely. And can you get there at all? And will your flight be canceled? And all these other. My only experience with snow at Christmas when I was a kid was my dad's family was from Buffalo, New York. Uh, and we went there for Christmas and the snow was literally taller than I was. That wasn't magical. That was terrifying. Right. I, I was like, if I go out and also I got locked in a closet accidentally because oh, they were yeah. like, put on a snow jacket. And I'm like five and I'm like standing in the closet trying to put on a jacket and somebody walked by and just closed the closet <laughs> and I couldn't get out and so I'm like all of my memories of snow from being little are not magical and I don't know why people like snow it's dirty and Albuquerque has the best snow because it disappears in four hours right so. right Mandy, is that a tradition now that we have to lock you in a closet on Christmas Please, Day? No. <laughs> no, that is not a tradition it happened once and it will never happen again <laughs> yeah yeah so um, then your tradition should be that all closet doors should remain open throughout <laughs> the holiday season. Like that should be the tradition in your family that passes down <laughs> that all that no closets get closed during <laughs> the month of December. Right. I don't even know who found me in the closet. So I'm not sure if it, uh, it was probably a, a, another kid. It was probably my older sister who fine. There were, there were too many children around. So. Yeah. Yeah. We've, we had a white Thanksgiving last year in Albuquerque, though. It started snowing the evening before. So in some ways, it was okay. We had friends come down from Denver, and it was okay because we at least they look outside and go, like, it's Thanksgiving Day. We're not going anywhere. Right, right. I, I had that same experience this year with usually we have a, you know, a weather eye out because we have to go get Cordelia, and her flight has to get in, and we have to make it down to the airport and back, et cetera, et cetera. And some years it's been bad enough. I think one time we actually had to pick her up and then go get a motel right close to the airport because we could not possibly make it home. And so, um, so yeah, we usually are constantly thinking about the weather. And this year we didn't have to do that at all. We were, as you say, we weren't going anywhere. So didn't pay any attention at all. So, the, so what tradition I, I thought of that in our family is, and I don't know about, other families because I know it depends is my grandmother started doing the big dinner Christmas Eve so on Christmas day we just ate leftovers and she wasn't stuck in the kitchen while oh, everybody else nice. was was opening gifts or or watching football games and so and I've seen some families do that and some families still do that giant meal on Christmas day which means someone's going to end up in the kitchen <laughs> separated right. from everybody else yeah yeah, I, I don't know what the rest of you do um, in our family, the big meal. You want to tell them, Cord? Yeah, so we always, uh, we our big uh, Christmas meal is a Christmas breakfast. So first we get up and we get ice, or ice cream. We get hot chocolate and we do our, our uh, stockings. And then we move in and we open up all of our presents under the tree and everything. And then we go and we cook a... a big breakfast which a breakfast doesn't take nearly as long to cook as right. like a big dinner dinner thing right. Right. so anyway and um i think it stemmed because when i was six i got a kid's cookbook and it had instructions on how to make scrambled eggs which was my favorite food and so i made scrambled eggs that year for christmas and then that just became the tradition and so <laughs> we always have scrambled eggs and sausages and uh a like coffee cake danish thing that we buy and grapefruits half a grapefruit with with brown sugar on top and, and many maraschino cherries yeah yes yes so all the maraschino cherry goes on. On. Yeah. yeah and uh and then hot tea and uh yeah and so and that's crackers, our big we always have crackers not then, oh yeah the english, the english crackers, crackers so then and we the always are hat. wearing our crowns during breakfast we always get a picture with our breakfast food and our crowns on so anyway yep and then oftentimes then we have a meal in the middle of the afternoon because we've ended up having this breakfast super late and super big breakfast so sometime in the afternoon then we either go out or uh somewhere or order in chinese in honor of a christmas story and so then <laughs> 
that kind of became our tradition of, hey, we could just do Chinese food and that would be great. So that's that's where the Jews are at. The Chinese exactly. food and, oh, the, exactly. and, and the movies, because that's the only thing that's open. Yeah. Or, fri- or Fridays. Fridays opens on Christmas Day. So go Friday. <laughs> and I was horrified that our favorite um, Thai restaurant was announced that they were going to be closed on Christmas Day. I'm like, you can't be. We're counting on you. So. <laughs> So, because they have a Chinese menu also, but it, but we found a Chinese restaurant that was open, so we were good. My husband's family always does tacos on Christmas Eve, and that tacos was a tradition good. I could I could handle. So we do tacos on <laughs> Christmas Eve, and then if we're hosting, we usually do some sort of rib roast or something on Christmas Day. Yeah. Uh, if it's just us, we usually get a bunch of Trader Joe's appetizers and just pop them in at various intervals throughout the day. Excellent. There you go. <laughs> So, well, when um, I spent one Christmas in London with my two best friends and it was just the three of us. And this was, you know, long ago before the days of Zoom or cell phones or anything. And so it's just the three of us. And uh, so we were trying to, you know, figure out, we were like, well, we want to have, this is the first Christmas we're away from our parents, you know, first Christmas on our own. We want to make it as much like Christmas as possible. And luckily each of us had a different traditional meal. So one of my friends uh, is from Minnesota and they had their traditional meal was on Christmas Eve and they had Swedish meatballs. And so we got to have Swedish meatballs on Christmas Eve. Then we got to have my Christmas breakfast. And then my third friend, they would have a Christmas dinner on Christmas day in the middle of the afternoon. And I can't remember if it was ham or turkey or whatever it was, but so we got to each have our traditional meal and share it with each other. So that worked perfectly. We got to each have what we considered the quintessential, you know, our quintessential meal, um, but we got to share it with each other. So that was very cool. I wanted to ask Connie, Connie, um, we were watching one of the holiday editions of the Great British Baking Show. Uh And they mentioned on this, but go ahead. They they mentioned on this episode that at one point, uh, Twelfth Night or Epiphany was actually more popular in Britain than Christmas. Yeah. And I'm guessing because of the parties, because they were talking about you would make Queen's cakes and stuff. And I was wondering if you if you if you heard of that, if it was actually Um, popular. Yeah, I think I think Epiphany has been various times and in various cultures the big the big holiday. Although I just want to say right up front that all Christmas desserts from Britain are terrible. They're terrible <laughs> and should not be eaten. Trifle is beyond Ugh. imagining, disgusting. And anything in which you take perfectly good ingredients and then pour custard over them is not to be eaten. Oh, um, so you just don't like custard. I'm like, what's wrong with trifle? It's just cake Ugh. and custard and fruit. Ugh. <laughs> you that. just don't like custard. Got it. <laughs> and plum pudding. One year, The first year I was married, I made a plum pudding, which took like six weeks because you have to make it and then steam it and then keep pouring liquor Soak over it. Soak it for you know? weeks, yeah. And um and at the end, it just tastes terrible. And you would have been better to just drink the alcohol from the bottle. So, and I made hard sauce to go with it, which is also terrible. Um, and Queen's cake, which I was just researching the other day, is terrible. They're all terrible. The mince pies, they're terrible. Oh, okay. They have wretched desserts. I don't know what's the matter with them. They can't come up with anything decent. What, in what, in is, what is a Queen's this. cake? I only know about king cake, which is a Mardi Gras thing. So Yes, that's a Mardi Gras thing. That's a good thing. That's a good, <laughs> a good cake. But Queen's cake is meh. And, uh, and like all of them, they don't, know, they don't know what they're doing. They have perfectly, they actually can make a good dessert. Profiteroles are really good, but they stole those from the French. <laughs> and and they do know how to make those, which is they're just a cream puff uh, filled with um, whipped cream, covered with chocolate sauce. And then you pour English cream over the top. And English cream is like we don't have anything like that in our, our country. It's a it's a thick, yellow, totally delicious cream that barely pours. <laughs> it's so good. It, it's like a million calories. Why they don't make that the national dessert, I'll never know, but they don't. <laughs> so, whereas we have all kinds of good desserts and cookies, lots of cookies, which I think is the best, the best Christmas dessert because you can eat many, 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 many of them and not keep track of how many you're eating. So 
Well, well, I think this is a good point that brings us to a good question, though, which is in America, we associate holidays very closely with food, it's that every holiday is very tied to what you eat. So that would bring my question of what is everybody's favorite Christmas or holiday, Hanukkah, or New, New Year's Eve, if you have a tradition like food. Personally, I hate all Thanksgiving foods and wish they would die in a fire. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, that's just my personal opinion. Yeah. Uh, but I love Christmas cookies. Uh, so, you know, yes, thank you for your cookies. <laughs> you, you and Lauren, thank you for your cookies. So Jamie, yes. what's your favorite? You have this wonderful. Lot cuz, lot cake, cuz, right? lot cuz. Yeah. I mean, um, oh, yeah, yeah. Hanukkah is everything fried. It's yes. potato latke. And donuts, and right? Donuts. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's a big one. Um, my family has this tradition. It's, um, we, it has been since dubbed grandma cake, but um, cause it's something my grandmother used to make, but, um, and the recipe has been passed down, but it's basically a cinnamon sugar coffee cake. And so it, it makes an appearance at pretty much every, nice. um, every holiday that we have um, that we can eat flour at. So not a Passover, but any of the other ones. Is it like a babka or? It's, um, it's, it's more like a, almost like an angel food cake, but not quite. Okay. It's kind of like a coffee oh. cake. I don't know. Uh, yeah. With cinnamon and yeah, cinnamon. yeah. You kind of make it like in a bunt tin. Bunt oh tin. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's good. Uh, well, well, uh, I have good. I have always loved latkes, and I have to say the best holiday season I think I ever had was uh, for two years. I worked at the Tucson Hebrew Academy, which was a private Jewish school in Tucson, and the first. The first Hanukkah I was there, every single night, different parents had a Hanukkah party, which of course, being a teacher, like we were invited to all of them. So I had eight nights of latkes. It was oh like, gosh. I was like, this is the best thing ever. And plus we had them at school one day. So basically I had nonstop latkes and I have never been able to like top that in terms of like oh. yummy holidays. <laughs> And Jews don't do anything without food. Like even right? the fasting holidays, we have a break the fast after. Right. Always... <laughs> and Samandi, no turkey for you at all? I don't like turkey. I don't like dressing. I don't like cranberries. I don't like green bean casserole or green oh, beans. I uh, About the only thing I'll eat is crescent rolls. Those are good. Uh, mashed potatoes. That's good. Um, Oh, I don't pie? like sweet potato casserole. I do like I do like some pies, but I don't like pecan pie. And being from the South, that's a oh, staple. That's why you had to move. Not a sin in the South, not to like. Uh, pie. I also don't like fried okra, which is also a sin. Oh, um, okay. I get that. So yeah, uh, I, I remember one Thanksgiving we were going to somebody else's house for Thanksgiving, and my mom took me to Whataburger beforehand and just gave me a <laughs> burger and said, "Eat this," and then pretend you're eating yep. and I was like okay <laughs> good mother yep that yeah. was that that's always been my thing I love cranberry sauce because I, I I'm totally a fruit person I will eat all fruit and so I would eat crescent rolls as much cranberry sauce as would fit in me and usually like a tiny little sliver of turkey I like turkey skin so if they have turkey skin I'll just eat a bite a piece of turkey skin and no actual turkey um, but yeah, then I have a crescent roll and then I just sit there and eat cranberry sauce and cause that's the only thing I like. So, cause I don't do mashed potatoes or gravy. So, so yeah. Yeah. We, we had uh, Turkey was usually think was usually, I'm sorry. Thanksgiving was usually Turkey or sometimes Cornish game hens, but Christmas was always kind of a free for all. It might be, uh, like this year we did a roast beef. It might be ham. It might be another Turkey. Um, Christmas never had a, a set exact thing. That right. seemed to always vary. Yeah. Yeah. I, I've i heard, I talked to a lot of people who said they'd had a standing rib, rib roast and that was their tradition in their, in their family for the holidays. I, this I, time I, we, I mean, we did a, I know people love standing rib roast. We did strip roast. I actually like it better. It's just me. I know. <laughs> no, I mean, I think Christmas is a little freer than the Thanksgiving for Everybody. For some reason. I know. What about? You should have what you like. I mean, you should. One year for Thanksgiving, my grandmother was just coming 
she had just come out of the hospital and we were just getting her settled in a retirement center in Greeley. And she was able to come to our house for Thanksgiving, but it was not, I mean, she wasn't particularly well and, and we have not had any time at home because we've been doing all this. So we had, we had deli turkey and um, macaroni and cheese Crap. and cranberry sauce yeah, crap, <laughs> and crescent rolls. And that was perfect. And so we frequently will have that as a, a Thanksgiving or a Christmas, you know, whatever, because it, uh, those are all foods that we really like. And um, Calvin Trillin, I don't know if you guys are familiar with him. He's one of my favorite writers. He wrote a whole bunch of food, food books, not like cookbooks, but about where to eat in America and funny essays. Uh, he's the person that first introduced me to Arthur Bryant's in Kansas City, best barbecue in the world and stuff like that. And he's, um, anyway, his, he had this theory that because America was uh, discovered by Columbus, we should all have spaghetti carbonara as our official <laughs> Thanksgiving day dinner. I support that. I, just, I thought this was a great idea. I love spaghetti carbonara. So occasionally we'll have spaghetti carbonara too, if we're just on oh, our- We used to, and actually for a time we would have on, uh, I think because of that, I think you had read that, on Christmas Eve, we would have spaghetti with spinach noodles, which are green. So yes. then it was red sauce on green noodles. So Christmas. Except, except spaghetti <laughs> carbonara is not, it's a white sauce. No, I, no, I, yeah, know, so I know, I know. But, yeah, but I think that spaghetti. was your inspiration. Yes. You were like, oh, well, right. we could just do spaghetti. Yeah, spaghetti with green noodles, that'd be, that'd do it. Yeah. yeah. That's so you so, could dream my, of, that's so you could dream of a white Christmas. There you go. And I don't know how this all works for the younger generations, but, um, you know, the traditional, like the line in Christmas story about my mother had not had a hot meal in years um, was so true. The, the women did all the work and were supposed to produce these amazing feasts and, and set the table and do all the dishes and bake the pies and everything else. And um, it was gradually starting to change when I was first married and um, not changing fast enough as far as I was concerned, but, uh, but starting to change. And mine really was changed because I sang in the church choir and we always had a, a Christmas Eve service. And I, that meant I didn't go I didn't have to be gone for the Christmas Eve service. I had to be gone for the entire evening because we were rehearsing. And so oh, big meals were out of the question, you know? And uh, I think as women have taken on more, uh, more responsibilities of other kinds that, that uh, they've had to do something with Christmas because it used to be a, a, a holiday where women did literally all the work. And that was a major problem. And uh, so I, I, I hope it's different now. Tell me it's different now. <laughs> so for all of you, it's different at my house now, but I mean, I'm hoping that women don't still get stuck with all of this. I remember the very first Thanksgiving I cooked, which I was in college and I'm living with my grandparents because they only lived like a mile from where I went to college. And my grandmother had massive foot surgery and I was just like, I will cook Thanksgiving oh. dinner. And everybody came. Like my brother, my mom, my uh, my aunt and her husband, my great aunt, and I was the only one cooking, except for my grandmother, who who kept wheeling herself in in her wheelchair and trying to help me <laughs> till I screamed at her and waved a giant chef knife around and, and told her to go and sit down and she cried. Yeah, yeah. That's where the <laughs> and, 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 always crying. And then proceeded after dinner to tell me, "See, it's just too much work for one pe one person." I'm like. It was fine. Like I had a list. Everything was prepped. I was good. My only problem was her kept, you know, right. wheeling herself in there. And then of course, and my brother who, who showed up with his girlfriend, he'd been dating for like a month maybe and decided, proceeded to tell me he was vegetarian after I started, they were both vegetarian now, after I started cooking everything. And there were literally, I think the only vegetarian <laughs> thing was green bean casserole and the sweet potatoes and the you know, I think that was it. Even the stuffing had chicken broth in it. I was like, dude, this would have been useful information a week ago. Yeah. <laughs> Earlier. Yeah. Earlier. Yeah. I don't know. I guess that spills into the terrible holiday. But, yeah. Do other, do, if it weren't the pandemic, would people like be having potluck type things where I don't mean potlucks, but you know, where everybody brings dishes and everybody participates. We used to do that, but we haven't in a while. We used to do potluck Thanksgiving 
like orphans Thanksgiving. So everybody who didn't have family in town right. Right. would bring a dish. I think we haven't done that in several years. For some of us, we live so far away from our parents that you can't do potluck, right? right. When, right. when I go home, I'm flying, you know, yeah. and my parents live in Florida. And so it's like, what am I bringing right. myself? Right. Uh, you go to the grocery and, store and buy a non pecan pie right now. <laughs> and, and, and I don't think my mom still doesn't really trust me in the kitchen. She thinks I'm going to burn the house down, you know. Uh, but but my mom now she just orders out Thanksgiving. She just mm. picks it all up from Trader Excellent. Joe's or like, wherever. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, uh, the, yeah, the Thanksgiving after I threatened my grandmother with the knife, we just started going out. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I didn't really threaten her with the knife. I yelled while waving. <laughs> what about what about you, Jamie? Is it spread out over? Is Hanukkah spread out over? The cooking is spread out over eight days, or it's eight days of drudgery. Or yeah, so Hanukkah is actually one of like the lesser Jewish holidays, so we don't do like a big feast for it, other than like just the fun stuff, like the donuts and stuff. So we we'll usually get together with like the big family, like one of the nights. Um, but yeah, I mean, the big, the big holiday for us is really the Thanksgiving. And, um, we used to joke, my mom doesn't make anything except reservations. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I'm all for that. But, uh, but yeah, what well, growing up, it was, it was kind of the potluck. Like we, you know, we did the Turkey, we always hosted at my house and we did the Turkey, but then everybody else brought all the, the side dishes and stuff. But my mom, her chair in the dining room was next to the door to the kitchen because she was the one that was always in and out so um but yeah now that you know now now thanksgiving's kind of moved to my house um in non-pandemic time so um you know we've got you know my husband's family comes to us or my sister and my mom will come to us or you know whatever so um so yeah it, it it's kind of a group effort everybody kind of gets their hands dirty and that's good that's really good <laughs> The last two years, I've done a friendsgiving with another family, and we the the we kind of split the 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 list yeah, in yeah. half, and mm -hmm. do half of it in my kitchen, half of it in her kitchen, and then we pick a house where we're gonna you know do the whole meal itself. So that does make it a lot more um, manageable, I would say, and probably uh, fun for everybody. Yeah, 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 definitely. So well, I know Craig had wanted to talk about holiday movies, people's favorite holiday movies. Well, I was gonna actually, I want to throw out a question first to the the writer since we have uh, Laura and Jamie and you here. And that is, of course, there's been also anthologies of Christmas stories. So my question was, what makes a science fiction fantasy story, a holiday story work? And do you all see any possibility of a pandemic or an isolation type holiday story uh, what working? What a terrible idea. <laughs> no, sorry. <laughs> You got to write something for 2021, Connie. Yeah. <laughs> Once this thing is over, I don't want to think about it anymore. There will be no pandemic stories from me. I wrote mine 25 years ago. So <laughs> I don't think it was set at Christmas. I can't remember. Yeah, deep, what, is Doomsday Book Doomsday set at Christmas? Doomsday Book has Christmas in it. Yeah. Yeah, I was thinking. Oh, that's right. Because the presents that Mr. Dunworthy gets for Colin. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I did it. I'm done. I did mine. <laughs> Oh. Yeah, mine, um, mine actually has brief mentions of, um, it, it takes place right after um, the big holiday, big Jewish holidays for the year, uh, Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur, so the Jewish New Year and Day of Atonement. Um, but actually, one of the common threads in my story is that um, there's, everybody has tracking chips in their head. And, um, it, you know, you, you can, you can do everything, like communicate with everybody at a blink of an eye, get access to the internet, you know, and knowledge really quickly. But, um, you know, the, the, the downside is that everybody, um, knows where you're going, who, you know, who, you, who you're talking to, um, what you're doing and what you're saying. And, um, and so, um, the, the piece of that is in direct juxtaposition with the main character who's Jewish, because, um, you know, when they observe Shabbat, you, um, you're supposed to turn everything off and relax. And, um, if you have a piece of technology in your head that you can't turn off, you can't do that. So, um, that story kind of has that, that conflict of, um, you know, how do I, how do I be an observant Jew when I can't fully observe my traditions because I have this technology. So, um, that's kind of a main, main tenet in, in the story, but, um, but I always, you know, I, I always think with, you know, you, you mentioned pandemic stories and, um, I thought it was kind of funny because the, um, 
you know, the whole tracking chip idea. And then when we went into the pandemic and they talked about contract tracing and knowing where people were and who was infected, I was like, oh God, not, not my book, don't make it real. <laughs> um, but yeah. I mean, I think we write all these things about everything hitting the fan and being bad so that we can kind of look into ourselves and um, what are we doing as humans and find that glimmer of hope. So, um, you know, I would hope if somebody was writing a pandemic story that they had that, that glimmer of hope piece, at least I know, you know, when I write sci-fi, I try to always look for that glimmer of hope, even though, um, you know, you, you do like to do all the horrible things to your characters, but um, there has to be that, that, that one shining light. It's not a story. <laughs> Right. Right. If everything's peachy, then why are you writing the story? <laughs> like, what's right. the story about? Uh, yeah. But, but is that what is that what really helps make a uh, any holiday story work? Is having that that glimmer of hope or that or or some kind of faith in it? Yeah, I, I don't. I mean, for me, my goal when I write Christmas stories is I don't want people to kill themselves at the end of the story. I don't mean my characters, I mean my readers. Um, I read, one of my favorite authors is Kristen La is, um, is Sigrid Unset, who wrote Kristen Lovren's Daughter and won the Nobel Prize and everything. She's a wonderful writer. But um, so she had a collection of Christmas stories from the 1920s and so I read it thinking she's one of my favorite writers how can this go wrong oh I just want to kill myself the stories were so depressing and I was like okay this is what you should not do with a Christmas story is they should they should not be I we we have plenty of time to discuss how rotten people are and how sad and intractable human problems are and how people really never change and all those things, just not at the holidays. So at no the holidays. Hans Christian Andersen, forget. No Hans Christian <laughs> Andersen, I stand by that. I think Hans Christian Andersen writes the worst Christmas stories of all time. And I just really feel like they should, it, they don't necessarily have to have a happy ending, but they have to, I guess, like Jamie said, a glimmer of hope or something that makes you glad you read the story. And uh, and it was interesting, I, this this story of mine that I read from, um, I, I, I've gotten really kind of good, surprisingly good response to it. And I'm like, I, I'm wondering if it's like people are just desperate for a happy ending right now. They just, they really want to read something that doesn't add to their problems, you know? And like you say, we put our characters through torture, which we have to, but, but, um, but they do like, people do like happy endings. I think they need happy endings at times when it's not totally clear that you're gonna get a happy ending. So I don't know. Lauren, what do you think? Well, I've never actually tried to write a story around a holiday, just period. Um, I struggle sometimes with, with organized religion. Um, and so I've kind of sidestepped it, but I love, love, love like Christmas movies. I love that there's just something, there's a switch that goes off in my brain in mid November where I'm just- talking real movies, not Hallmark movies, right? I'm talking yeah. all of them. So oh, yes, I, I do, I do sometimes watch the Hallmark ones cause I, you know, I, I, you know, I love the romances and things like that, but there are, there are not many good ones. I will totally give you that but I, I do think though for a Christmas movie to be a Christmas movie it can't just be a glimmer of hope there has to be some sensibility about the the Christmas spirit and that's a very specific um, thing and it's I, I think that if that's present then yes I think it you know that's that would be a goal of the story regardless of the trappings regardless of what time period it's set in whether it's in the future whether it's some sort of pandemic story or whatever i i think that regardless of how overtly religious it is regardless of how um surface level but that that cr christmas spirit that 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 embodiment that needs to be there somehow yeah i we, that's hard to we do. were watching oh i'm sorry was somebody else had something we yesterday we were working on a jigsaw puzzle and as a result and you need something on in the background so we watched like uh home alone like four times <laughs> and i was real realizing what i love about that movie i love that movie and it's not it's not the cartoon you know violence although that's, it is pretty funny i have to admit they they were very clever at making it cartoon violence as opposed to real violence and um but it there's there's a scene 
there are two scenes that I absolutely love. One of them is when um, the the, uh, the little boy, uh, Kevin, is he's walking home on Christmas Eve and his um, and all the windows have these families inside, you know, and they're all together and they're all opening presents or eating or laughing and talking or hugging each other. And it's just so sad because he doesn't have his family and he never appreciated his family. But, you know, you can just see him realizing that that's what Christmas is all about. And then the other scene, of course, I love is the one in the church where he's, he's um, talking to the old man that he's been so scared of who he thought was the, what was it, the, the, snow shovel slayer and uh and the he comes over and talks to him and he says well you know do you know why i'm here i'm here because i'm listening to my little granddaughter up there the little redhead she's singing uh rehearsing and i can't come tonight i'm not welcome and kevin says in church and he says no everyone's always welcome in church but i'm not welcome with my family and then and then kevin gives him this great advice about how you should call your son and you should be with your family on Christmas. It's really that to me is the heart of the movie, you know, and it, and I, I love that John Hughes wasn't afraid to be sentimental. You know, he, he has a lot of very funny stuff. And I love that the movie ends with a very sentimental picture of Kevin watching the grandfather reunited with his, his granddaughter and his family. But then, uh, then it ends with his brother saying, Kevin, what did you do to my room? And so it, it doesn't end on a, you know, a sentimental note. And uh, I think that's smart too. I think you don't want too schmaltzy. But um, I, I think that you're right. I think there has to be something, whatever you think the message of the holiday season is, has to be, has to be present in those stories. And, and whether it's being with family or forgiveness or, you know, um, I don't know, whatever, whatever you think, uh, loving kindness, you know, the, the story about Scrooge is really, you know, the, the best moment is when he orders the turkey <laughs> and has the kid buy the turkey and he's going to try to make up for all his mistakes and stuff. I, you know, so I, I, yeah, if it doesn't have that, it doesn't count. It's, and, and I just helped uh, edit a Christmas story collection for, um, the American, uh, the Library of America. And um, we had a lot of considerations trying to get stories from everybody in America, plus uh, from all eras in America. But, um, but it was interesting because there are many, many stories that are set at Christmas, but I would not, they're just set at Christmas, you know, and they don't have any of that spirit in them. So well, and I think oh, yeah. the, some some of those movies that are just set at Christmas and, you know, people argue about whether they're Christmas movies or not. And I, I'm not, you know, I'm not a fancy writer, uh, but, uh, you know, I watch a lot of movies. Um, plain writer as opposed to fancy writer. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, when you look at something like Iron Man 3 or Die Hard or, you know, you ask yourself, why is this set or Gremlins, you know, and you ask yourself, why is this set at Christmas? And I think even though they're not Christmas movies, it's because of that backdrop of Christmas underscores the disconnection the main character is feeling, right? right. Die Hard, he's completely disconnected from his family at the beginning of the movie. And by the end of the movie, right, he's re-earned his family, yeah, I, I guess. Uh, you know, Iron Man 3 is the same way. At the beginning of the movie, he cannot connect with Rhodey or Pepper. He's completely disconnected. He gets her a giant rabbit. What does it mean? I don't know. You know, uh, by the end of the movie, it comes full circle, you know, it, because having Christmas as the background emphasizes their loneliness, right? Because we know this is a right. time when you're supposed to be together it's it's shorthand right right I agree uh, with that. yeah and, and so it's like, it's like is puzzle. gremlins a christmas movie probably not you know but it, it does use the background of christmas as a shorthand for this kid's isolation and then trying to solve the gremlin problem by himself and then of course he can't right and he has to bring together a bigger group right. well, one, of, one I, of the I, big I, questions was is die hard a christmas movie or not and I find it interesting that Barack Obama and Bruce Willis have both said no, but the films, but the film's director has said yes. Okay. I read a very good argument for it being a Hanukkah movie. I'm just 
you know, because it's I about, have to see that argument. I, 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 I forget where I saw it, but it was because it was about like striving, you know, you're alone and striving against, uh, you know, the oh, yeah. and, yeah. <laughs> and against and dirt occurs. Yeah. Yeah. So, well, and I, def- yeah. I definitely think families, the, the theme of family, whether it's blood family or a family you make is definitely a part of the holidays, whether it's planes, trains, and automobiles set at Thanksgiving, where, you know, by the end of it, John Candy, you know, was invited to the family dinner. (laughs) Right, he's part of the family. Or A Long Way Down, which is that starts on New Year's Eve and is about these four misfits who are all going to kill themselves on New Year's Eve. But then they, you know, end up, becoming a family and saving each other and so i definitely think i think the theme of family be it blood relations or family you make is a big part of holiday movies and make something of a holiday movie so i'm speaking of families hello family (laughs) and if you uh if if any of you don't know this this movie a long way down is a nick hornby novel uh and it's set at new year's eve apparently a lot of people kill themselves by jumping off this one very high building in London on New Year's Eve. That's sort of a thing. If you're going to kill yourself, that's the time and place to do it. He didn't make that part up, but the part he makes up is that this at the beginning, the person is going to kill themselves and is all ready to jump and then gets interrupted by someone else who is there to kill themselves and really annoyed right. to find that someone is ahead of them in line. And then <laughs> And then yes, two other there, people show up as and well. Two other people show up and then it all sort of devolves from there. Wonderful, wonderful movie. Yeah, yeah. they're actually, it, it sounds depressing, but it's such it's a, a hopeful movie. It's so. a great movie. It's, it's a, a very, lovely, very, yeah. yeah, really lovely. I would call it a Christmas movie because mm-hmm. yeah. it's about finding a family. Yeah. Making a family. Yeah. From a lot of, uh, from a lot of Connie's visits uh, at conventions in here in Albuquerque, of course, we know a lot of the classics that we usually end up talking about, like uh, Miracle on 34th Street and um, uh, It's a Wonderful Life and White Christmas and, and all of those. But what are some of the newer ones that people have been discovering? And I do actually want to throw out when we were talking about the nativity scene earlier, it reminded me of we just watched Love Actually again. And mm-hmm. I kind of want there to be a Christmas octopus and a Christmas I penguin know. and a that's second so penguin. Yeah, a second second lobster. Second, yeah, second lobster. lobster. That was it. There are two. There were two lobsters present at the birth of our Lord Jesus. Yes. Duh. 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 When you're combining schools, you gotta have a role for everybody. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Yeah. That's a lovely Christmas pageant. And I, I recommend a TV movie, uh, the, uh, the TV movie of uh, the best Christmas pageant ever. Although none of the adaptations of that are as good as the book. The book is wonderful a, and it's yeah. a children's book. So if you've never read it, you should definitely read it. It's My teacher rare. read it to us in elementary school. <laughs> it's a great, great book. The Her- Herdmans, is that who they are? The Herdmans were the worst children in the world. And they are the worst children. <laughs> they are. So, and they brought a ham to the baby Jesus. So, <laughs> creative. I don't know. I feel like the worst person at the nativity is, of course, the little drummer boy, because oh, who God. plays a drum oh, at God. the birth of a baby? Right. right. That's true. <laughs> who gave that kid a drum? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, well, I could see that happen. This is my least favorite Christmas carol ever. <laughs> so, although there are many bad ones. <laughs> You discovered a you discovered a new film this year that's kind of a little different this year, Connie. Oh yes, that that was a friend gave this gave us this movie several years ago, and we never watched it. It was one of those. Oh yeah, we'll, we'll watch it someday. So this year we were telling him about our pandemic plan to watch things with Cordelia, where you call and then you say we're starting the movie now, and then you watch it, and then and then you um, talk about it later. Excuse me. So he said, how about we do that with this movie? So we, we were forced into watching it and it quickly ascended to near the top of our favorite Christmas movies ever. So it's called Rare Exports. It's a Finnish movie and it's subtitled. And, um, and it's like nothing you've ever seen. I don't really want to say a lot. It's a horror movie. Um, but <laughs> it's, but it, 
I hate horror. Let me just go on record. I hate horror movies. I hate slasher movies. I hate all of those things. I loved this movie. And um, I, I, yeah, I wouldn't recommend it, I guess, for little bitty kids, but it, although I think they'd really love if they're like eight years old and up, I think they'd love it because the hero is a kid. And, uh, and it's just, I don't want to say anything else, except it's just great. It's one of my favorite Christmas movies now. So, and very, very, very different from, and if you're tired of the same old stuff, this is brand new and very different. So you had, and, you had a new one from last year too. And the new one from last year was Nativity. Is that the one you're talking about? No, last oh, the, George last Michael. Christmas. Oh, Last Christmas. Oh, I love Last Christmas. Yes. Last Christmas, a uh, script by Emma Thompson. Emma Thompson is in it. Emily Clark, is that right? Yeah, from Game Amelia, I think. Amelia Clark. Amelia Clark. And who's the guy? The guy who was in Crazy Rich Asians. Yeah. Oh, who's gorgeous. He's so gorgeous. Um, yeah. A romantic comedy. Um, love, they filmed it at Christmas in London, which you cannot beat that for a set. And it's just a wonderful, lovely touching henry golding that's his name henry golding thank you and he's adorable adorable and it's yeah really my fun. husband and i just watched that movie actually right before christmas and we How were both like think? is that the guy from crazy rich asians yeah so yeah. i knew the spoiler going oh, yeah. in okay uh because people were talking about it yeah. on twitter when it came out yeah uh but we both thought it was a good christmas movie uh yeah. i i think people were disappointed with it because it wasn't what they wanted it to be it's right. not I mean, I'm just gonna say it's not a rom-com, right? And people yeah, wanted it's, it's, it to be a rom-com. It's, it's, it's a really Christmas like, movie. They wanted level, it to be Love Actually too, is what they want. No, I, well, I, think, I yeah. don't think yeah. I, I don't think it advertised itself as Love Actually too. I think the problem with the advertising is it kind of advertised it as a bigger budget Hallmark movie. Oh yeah, That's which I would say is not what it was. It was a Christmas movie more in vain with It's a Wonderful Life and other kinds of movies That's that make true. you appreciate the family you have. Right. That's, right. That's true. But I also, I will argue that it is in many ways a romantic comedy in that in romantic comedies, one of the rules is that you, the, the goal is not for the couple to get together. The goal is for the couple to figure out what love really is and uh, to love something more than yourself. And I think that the, that movie qualifies in all those ways, but, but no, it's not a traditional romantic comedy. So yeah, but well, yeah, but we we liked it. I mean, I mean, I like all of those actors, you know. Yeah, uh, so. I uh, I read the I read all the the critics reviews and I was like, what movie did you see? I don't I don't understand why you didn't like why you hate it because they hated it, and I did not understand why they hated it so much. But because uh, I just thought it was a lovely movie, and this year we watched it obviously knowing knowing what it was when we went into it. And I liked it even better. I felt that it was just uh, a lovely movie. My favorite spot in the movie, this is not, I don't think a spoiler, but at one point the heroine is, is um, who works at a Christmas shop and is, spends most of the movie dressed as an elf. Um, she's, she's in a show and she says, she begins, she comes on stage in her Christmas elf costume and says, I knew the lighting would be crap, so I brought my own and then proceeds to light herself up with Christmas lights all over her costume. And it's really cute and funny and charming. And I was crying at the end. If I'm crying at the end of a Christmas movie, I'm always happy. So that's my standard of excellence. I was not crying. Well, I guess I was crying at the end of Rare Exports. So, yeah. So. Lauren, did you have a rom-com that you watched that was Christmas? Oh, yes. I watched Netflix Holiday. And oh, so how is that? it will not make you cry, <laughs> I'm pretty sure. Okay. But if you're looking for a well-produced, um, like, a, like a Hallmark-esque movie, but that's well-cast, well-produced with a great, great soundtrack, a great supporting story, um, I really enjoyed it. It stars Emma Roberts, a low-rent Chris Helmsworth. I'm not quite sure, but he's Australian. Um, so, um, and it's basically this, they, 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 they can contrive this thing where they're going to just be each other's date for every holiday and just kind of diffuse any sort of questions from the family. Like, why aren't you dating blah, blah, blah. And this other person. So they always have a date for the major holidays and not be left out. Um, and it's really cute. Um, and it's very raunchy too. So it's, it's kind of like this, there's something about Mary-esque 
in a rom-com that's also has like the hallmark kind of trappings to it so it's it's doing a lot of interesting things it's very subversive in that respect but it's also just really funny um and again the rom the, the, rom the romance is, uh, is there as well so oh, good. i enjoyed that very much i've heard really good things about it from everybody who's seen it so yeah that's good it's always good to have a new movie to <laughs> watch it's something you haven't watched a thousand times although we're happy to watch them a thousand times so jamie what's your favorite holiday movie <laughs> for holiday movies um i love home alone i'm a big home alone fan um i did watch the holiday i did really enjoy that one um I also really like um, some of the, the recent Netflix ones. Um, I just watched Jingle Jangle the other day, which is super cute and um, great for kids. It's musical. It's got a little bit of engineering in there, even though it's a little um, not real engineering, it's, um, but it's, it's magical fun engineering. So that was fun. Um, and I also really liked um, the, what is it? The, is it the a Prince for Christmas or the Christmas Prince? The Royal, the, it's got like three movies. Um, where she's a reporter and ends up falling in love with the prince. Um, spoiler alert, but <laughs> I think everybody knows how those kind of go. It's a Christmas movie. Right. <laughs> and uh, and I also like the the one with Vanessa Hudgens, uh, the Princess Switch. That was uh, super. I I just love the like the 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 falling in love, cutesy like finding someone for the holidays kind of feel. So. Yeah. I am prepared for Princess Switch 3 and there being four Vanessa Hudgens. I just say, let's just exponentially more Vanessa Hudgens every movie. Okay. Uh, I fully support that. And I, I also love that the Christmas Prince family was in the second movie in the, in that, uh, in the coronation scene. So yeah, I was the like, Netflix we're in the same universe. universe. <laughs> Where are these countries? That's what I wanted. To know. <laughs> we're in Europe. The Diaries and the Princess... You know all these oh the prince and me and all those and i was like where are these the prince and me is like denmark so that's a real country oh yeah, that's actually a real country you're right you're right that is a I, say, I, i've always like wanted next to Liechtenstein or something right. i've always <laughs> wanted to know Middle where East. uh vulgaria from chitty chitty bang bang is supposed <laughs> to be that's true. That's true. <laughs> so they're probably somewhere near there these uh, are probably all left they're all left over from like the merry widow the, and those ruritanian operas that they did at the turn of the century uh, and then the Marx Brothers also did. So maybe they're just <laughs> leftover countries and they've been renamed and they had a coup and, you know, renamed them and we're good. So I'm happy with that. I just wanted some sort of explanation. That's all. <laughs> well, I, I just like to say that um, I remember the first time on a holiday special that they sh included Hanukkah and it was with the Pee Wee Herman Christmas special yeah, in the 80s true. and I was yeah. so excited um, that they had Hanukkah and it was the dinosaurs that lived in the mouse hole in his in his apartment and Which they the dinosaurs were Jewish right. and anyway and I remember they they did this whole little you know animation thing and and that was the first time I'd ever seen it but now like so many of when they do like a a holiday special that's not a movie but the holiday special so many of them do include things for like Hanukkah and Kwanzaa and solstice and stuff and I just watched um yes I admit it a uh holiday special with the kid the kids from the new high school musical uh series and anyway um and two of the actors on that show are Jewish and so they actually, both of them talked all about their holiday traditions at this time of year and everything. And I just, I think it's really interesting that things have changed that that is now included in so many of the holiday specials that, you know, they do have, have something where they are including Hanukkah and, and you know, other, other holidays that are, are at this time of year. And I think that's really cool. And they don't act like it's they don't exist, so... Right, yeah. right, right. It's so. definitely getting better, although there was, I don't know if it was a Hallmark or a Lifetime or something. Yes. Where they had a supporting character that was a Jewish character, but they basically were there to just ask questions about Christmas because they didn't know anything about Christmas. <laughs> well, that's yes. not really how it works. Like, you know about <laughs> right. Christmas. Like, I don't know everything about Christmas, but I do right. know what Christmas is. And what, what the well, that's, 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 no. that's, that's, that's the whole thing too about Christmas has become very 
secular too. And so I think that right. that most people know what the basis of Christmas is, but it's it's more interesting when when we talk about all the traditions coming from places is how many how many are winter based. I mean, we had the oh, yeah. solstice and we had Tannenbaum and, 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 uh, midwinter and it, and they all come together. And, and the message on all of them really is like, be kind. Right. And, kind. Stay warm, <laughs> eat lots. Okay. Yeah. And that the light is coming back, light we're is in coming the darkness, back. but we're coming out of the, out right. of it. And yeah. Right. And I love the fact that candles are, a symbol of all, like all the holidays, pretty much of this, this time of year. You if know, there's one thing that binds us together, it's toddlers trying to burn us down. Yes, <laughs> exactly. <right. laughs> sure. Exactly. Sure. But I just, I, I like the idea of, of candles, you know, at this right. time of year, because they are, you know, shining a light so in the hard. darkness. <laughs> yeah. Shining a light in the darkness. So. Right. Yep. Right. Well, it was interesting when, um, like I say, I was helping edit this collection, Christmas collection for uh, Library of America, and that it's specifically the history of the Christmas story in America. So, so very limited. <laughs> we had to, the stories we had to choose from were very limited, but we had a number of stories. Um, Grace Paley's The Loudest Voice in the Room, which is a great story about a, a little Jewish girl trying to cope with, she's she's been given a part in the Christmas pageant and her parents are trying to decide whether that's a good idea or not. It was written back in the 1940s and really powerful story. And then, um, and then uh, there's a story called The Christmas Kid by Pete Hamill, which was my, my favorite story uh, in the entire collection. And um, I love Pete Hamill as a writer anyway, but it's about a, a, a Jewish orphan who comes to America in a uh, neighborhood in Brooklyn. No, that's wrong, in Chicago, in Chicago. And uh, Brooklyn, Chicago, they're very similar. And, um, and then, uh, and, and, and what happens? It's, it's got drama, it's got excitement, it's got a Christmas pageant, it's got everything. It's a great story. And, um, and it, it was, uh, we, we included lots of different things and we, and we went out of our way, even with our very limited, you know, uh, thing that we had to do, which was do the American Christmas story. Uh, <clears throat> we were able to include all kinds of stuff, which would not have happened 30 years ago. If this was being done, it would just be all straightforward Christmas stories. Now it's, there were stories from Puerto Rico and Jamaica and uh, the South, uh, the uh, Hispanic Southwest and, and, amazingly a number of Christmas stories written by African Americans before the Civil War and right after the Civil War, which, you know, this was a time when their, their opportunities to give voice to stories was like incredibly limited and these stories are amazing. And my second favorite story in the collection is uh, Langston Hughes's, um, I think it's just called Christmas Eve, One Christmas Eve. So, but a story that I did not know that he had ever written anything but poetry. I thought he just wrote poetry, but this is a lovely story. So, so I hope things are getting slightly better. But, um, but like I say, is particularly since we had a very narrow um, thing that we were trying to do, but even, even so we, it's, it's getting better, I think. Slow, Absolutely. so slow. Yeah. <laughs> Things. The Rugrats Hanukkah special episode is actually yep. very good. Uh, <laughs> and and I mean, I was a kid when that came on and I was like, oh, this is what Hanukkah is about. I remember like, you know, watching it. I think they also have a Passover episode, uh, yes. but uh, that I was more Rugrats familiar with. Asking about Christmas. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. the Rugrats, the family is Jewish. Right, so I, know, that's, but I mean. That, that seems so terrible, <laughs> what you were describing, Jamie, about just asking about Christmas. Oh, As yeah. It, that... That's what it's all really about. So everyone should really <laughs> find out more about it because yeah. no one, it's not in your face constantly, <laughs> every it's moment. Not like there's 10 million Hallmark movies about it. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Yeah. That's why I've always found the war on Christmas so inexplicable. I'm like, if there is a war on Christmas, it's apparently losing because <laughs> Christmas is like everywhere. And as I always loved uh, w, uh, PG Woodhouse's comment, Christmas has us by the throat again. And I thought, yeah, that's it. There you go. 
That's yeah, well, usually, I, usually right before uh, Halloween, actually, at most stores. Yeah, yeah right. exactly. I think yeah. I was saying before, you know, before we started filming that I went to a very diverse high school, uh, which is true. And so I had a lot of Muslim kids, a lot of Hindu kids, uh, and almost all of them celebrated Christmas. Yeah. Uh, like the only kids who did not celebrate Christmas were the Jewish kids. Uh, and that's because a lot of these kids' families were immigrants and they came over here and they thought Christmas as an American holiday, like Thanksgiving. Uh, and so it's something they were supposed to do. Um, right. And so it's like, yeah, if there is a war on Christmas, uh, Christmas won. Uh, <laughs> a long, long time ago. Yeah. <laughs> Which many of us are not 100% happy about. I mean, there are many aspects of Christmas that are not pretty. <laughs> well, you know, can't, Canada's trying to get Boxing Day in there, but it's just not working. <laughs> Look, you know, we can go back. I, I was in Latin club in high school. We want to bring the Saturnalia festival back. Um, five five days that. long. I think I, I I think we should do it. So. Okay. Yeah. Well, I think I think they can if they appeal on the Boxing Day stuff, if they appeal to the shopping nature of Americans and and focus on the, you know, the the English Boxing Day sales, you know, where they have the Boxing Day sale at Harrods or whatever. It, you know, kind of, it's like the, it's like the Black Friday sales, but you know, it's the day after Christmas. Well, I think then they could civilized. get Boxing Day to become a big tradition because they just have to know how to sell it to Americans. That's right. For well, Americans, it's all about consumption. So. That's right. Well, it's true. Well, we you, can be at the mall. Get, it's great. Yeah. yeah. I was going to say we do get it here because the day after Christmas is Returns Day. Right. And right. right. Oh, look, every. Oops. Everything thing for Christmas is 50% off. I will admit right. that's usually when we get our Christmas cards for the next year. <laughs> right. Oh, we had, we had neighbors across the street when we lived in Woodland Park who we, uh, we've known people with lots of holiday traditions, but this was the one we simply could not grasp. You want to tell them about it, Cord? So yeah. their tradition was on the day after Christmas, they would take back everything that they'd been given, exchange it and buy something. Even if it was something they liked. So, so like they would get something that they totally loved and everything, but their tradition was, and you had to take it to the store and return it the next day and buy something else. <laughs> now it didn't work with the, for us because we would buy all of their gifts from the Goodwill right. and then they couldn't return anything from the Goodwill. So they were but stuck. We bought, but we also didn't buy what they bought. We bought, we bought, you know, books and, and right. CDs and, and DVDs or they didn't have those VHS tapes, I guess. Yeah. Those albums and DVDs. albums and things, but they, they would, they bought mostly clothes and shoes and things like that. And you can understand they, the chances of their, if it being something that didn't fit or something and, or not your taste and wanting to take it back. Uh, but Gee whiz, they did. They literally took everything back, whether they liked it or not, and turned it in. It was a family tradition. The stupidest holiday tradition we ever Where I was taught, if grandma home. gives you something you don't like, you just have to put it in the back of your closet and then, you know, bring <laughs> right. it out once a year when she visits. That's right. <laughs> Particularly if it's a pink rabbit suit, right? Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and on, on that note, uh, we're, yeah. we've kind of gone a while here, so... We should wrap it up. I want to thank all of our participants today uh, from Connie Willis to Cordelia Willis to Jamie Crackover, Lauren Defoe, uh, Jessica Coyle, uh, our tech whiz, Mandy Self. Thank you. And thank you for joining us. And this has been a, a fun reading and discussion. And uh, happy new year. Everybody happy stay new year, everybody. Yeah, yeah. yeah, everybody stay safe and wear your mask, social distance. It's, the pandemic is not over yet, but hopefully. Next year at this time, it will be better. It will be better. Yes. I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> so happy new year, everybody. Yes. Happy yeah. new happy year. Happy new year. 2021. 2021. Yay. <laughs> <laughs>